Here he is, the co-host of the Bob McCowan podcast, the former executive producer of Hockey Night in Canada, our Friday regular, Mr. John Shannon. How are you? Hello, boys. Great. How are you? Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we'll get to Taves in a second, but you're the uh, you were the broadcast kingpin of hockey huh. in this country, John. And if you just went a little bit over the border, you got to one of the great characters, one of the great play-by-play men in hockey. Uh, a word or two on the passing of the great Rick Jenneret of the Buffalo Sabers. Yeah, Maddie. You know, you know, I, I'm actually in Niagara Falls today, just oh. across across the border. And um, when you look at what Rick Jenneret stood for for the Buffalo Sabers, particularly in the last decade, where the team was brutal, where the team had no hope, Rick Jenneret carried not the broadcast. Rick Jenneret carried the team. <laughs> he made he made every night exciting. He made every game palatable. And whether the Sabres won or the Sabres lost, you at least turned the TV or the radio off and said, boy, Rick made me enjoy the night. He was a, a character. He had a ton of fun. And, and he really knew the game well. He, he's going to be missed in Buffalo. I will tell you that right now. He's a legend. Well, and John, I, I couldn't help but think as I saw the news last night and was taking it in, and of course, the Sabres and Canucks expansion cousins, neither of them have won a Stanley Cup championship. <laughs> we said a lot of the same things about John and John over the last decade here, and of course, older Canucks fans would have said a lot of the same things about Jim Robson yeah. when the team was struggling back in the day, right? You're, you're, you're not wrong. And, and, you know, it, it really what it does do, and this is something that I tried to reinforce when I was at Hockey Night and when I was with the league, is that it, it's really important to have somebody who is a communicator, a pipeline to the fan base that can, re, can, can almost insulate you, not in the good days, but insulate you in the bad days of your franchise. And you're right. Jimmy did that for years. Jimmy Houston did that for years. John and John have done that for years, and in the in that same vein, what Rick Jenneret did for the Buffalo Sabers. The great thing about Jenneret, guys, was and 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 maybe a lot of people on the West Coast don't know, Rick Jenneret still lived in Canada. He didn't live in Buffalo. He he lived in St. Catharines and Niagara Falls, uh, and commuted to okay. Saber games. Yep, he he was he was a huh? true Canadian. He was a great Canadian, uh, and loved Canada. Oh wow! Yeah, and and uh, that's what that's kind of what made Jenneret special. I, I will tell you one story. When I was the uh, VP of broadcasting at the NHL and we were starting one of our contracts with uh, with Versus in the United States, I got a call from the president of the Sabres, Larry Quinn, uh, who was absolutely livid that, uh, uh, that uh, Versus had hired a certain guy to be their play-by-play guy. And he says, you know what you guys need? You need my guy. You need Rick Jenneret. You need him to be on a national level to sell the game to people who don't understand it because at least they'll have fun. Great stuff. Great well, stuff. And, and John, answer me this. Um, I, I think he had sort of national and league wide appeal because of the May Day goal, right? Yep. Otherwise I think maybe he's a local legend and he's, he, he's known a little bit through other markets, but the May Day goal made him a league wide, a worldwide hockey broadcasting sensation well and and when you look at all the other sports of the great characters you know harry carey in baseball um i'm I'm not sure there was one in the national football league on a local level uh but you know whether it was johnny most or marv albert doing the knicks or or the celtics uh or the great voices of some nba teams rick jenneret was up there as 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 he truly stood as a great ambassador for your team a great ambassador for the sabers and when it came to guys who were living legends in their own market he made a difference that's why they i mean they they had a they had a night for rick jenneret when he retired um and 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 the viewership was probably higher that night and the event was that much better because everybody knew what he meant to the buffalo sabers and to the fan base 
to the players too. We've talked to Brad May countless times about that call. That call um, it means a lot to them. Uh, Daniel Briere releasing a statement today, uh, talking about what the calls of his of his exploits in Buffalo meant to him. So, ex Canuck Ryan Miller too, Blake, yeah. uh, talking about Rick and and what he meant, and yeah. particularly on his night there in Buffalo. No, we lost the giant of hockey broadcasting of that. Uh, of that, there is no doubt. On Jonathan Daves. What do you make of this statement, John? That he is not fully retiring, but he's taking the year off hockey. Do you think we you do you think we see him playing again? Well, he's such a competitor that it wouldn't surprise me that a year from now, um, that you know he gives it one more crack. You know, we 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 all know elite athletes, and he he certainly is an elite athlete. But what he's gone through with his blood disorders, what he's gone through in the last two or three years and through COVID, um, you have to respect what he's done. You know, we're, we're, you know he's, what, he, what he's delaying in my mind, which is interesting, he's de- delaying the inevitable induction to the Hockey Hall of Fame by doing this. Um, but to, to me, if there was a player that could take another year off, uh, and what is, let's face it, he's really only played. 45 games in the last three seasons. Anyway, uh, he hasn't played very much. Jonathan Taves could be one of those guys. And I still think he loves the game enough to want to find a place to play, but he has to be at a hundred percent. And obviously he believes he's not at a hundred percent yet. Do you think that he has the desire deep down to come back to the national hockey league? Or do you think this is just a, an easy way out first step sort of in a phased retirement? I, I would not put it past Taves to come back. I really wouldn't. I, I would not put it past Jonathan Taves, who's a, as smart a player as you're ever going to see in the NHL, uh, to, to get back to that 100% health and then make one last crack at it. Again, the only thing he's, in, he, he's, he's delaying is, you know, the year that he gets inducted to the Hockey Hall of Fame because it's three years after you retire. Right. So if he doesn't retire... He he can't be considered into, on the ballot three years from now. Is uh, is his legacy somewhat different than he would have liked, given what's happened with the Blackhawks organization and and uh, and people's uh, disgust with how it all went down with regards to Beach? I don't think so. I, I really don't. I I think. I think the naysayers, and I, I have a ton of respect for people who have uh, have an issue with the Blackhawks, and I think everybody should have a level of issue with the Blackhawks. Um, but we will never really know. I read the investigation. I'm sure you guys did too. Let's we'll maybe never reset really this. Know, we, we never really know what the Blackhawks did uh, or what the Blackhawk players knew and what they did. We'll, we'll never know that. But I think his legacy for... You know, Canadian hockey and his, le- his legacy for, as the Blackhawks captain and winning three Stanley Cups will still stand. John, our first opportunity to talk to you. Uh, we talked to you last Friday, and then uh, later that day, Pew Suter signs with the Vancouver Canucks. A lot of people thought this was one of the better remaining free agents, and he feels a need at, at third line center. A word or two on uh, what you made of the Canucks business on Suter. Well, we, on Friday, we talked about how, the, how they were improving their depth and how they've done a pretty good job at, at, you know, getting better in their bottom six. And this is just another extension of that. You know, I, I, I think the Canucks are going to be, if they can stay healthy and Thatcher Demko can stop pucks, I think they're going to surprise a lot of people in the Pacific Division. Uh, I, th- I think you've got Edmonton and you've got Vegas. And then I think that if they, uh, on a good day, you, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see the Canucks vying for that third spot and guys like Suter and depth players. And that's the one thing I think we, you know, we constantly learn all the time guys is the importance of your depth players. And if the Canucks could just get th- through the hump of the schedule in the regular season and get to the playoffs, their depth players are, have certainly, I think, put them in good stead if they do get a playoff spot. They've got the superstars, but that's all they had for uh, right. for the last year, you know. And and you're right; they need a break. They need somebody to fill roles. So they were asking superstars to do everything, and and the superstars do need a break, and they need other people to to pull some of their own weight. Well, and that's isn't that the Vegas blueprint? That's the Vegas blueprint. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was their defense and their depth players that put, in my mind, the Golden Knights on the championship level. 
John, we don't often see trades during training camp, or at least not big trades in advance of setting rosters, but with as many big pieces out there and with some teams uh, tight to the cap and whatnot, is your antenna up at all for any kind of trades and, and bigger activity than we normally see once teams centralize here next month? Well, let's remember there are teams that are those. There are teams over the cap. You can be ten percent over the cap during this time of year, but you, once you get to camp, you're going to have to be compliant by a certain point. So it would not surprise me to see some movement. Um, and and I and I still think that there's a possibility of even before camp, Maddie, that that we see some movement of some of these teams that are that close uh, to, to the eighty-three or eighty-four five or whatever whatever the number is these days. Yeah. That to me, that I think that's a reality of the business. It, it, to me, it's been relatively quiet this August after everybody's come back from their holidays. But it would not be surprised me to to see some movement be, between now and the uh, and the the start of camp. And then you're right during during camp when teams start to panic and say we're gonna we're gonna be in a situation of only playing 21 players, not 23. Yeah, Vancouver, one of six teams that depending on how you slice it, is showing at $3.7 million or more over the cap. A bunch of those teams have LTR, LTIR cushion. But, yeah, uh, the calculators are going to get a workout, I think, when we're setting opening night rosters based on uh, what has basically been a flat cap for the last few years and a number of clubs that are right tight against it or even over it. John, marvelous stuff. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll catch up next Friday. Yeah, and Matty, just uh, I, I know you got lots of viewers and, and listeners uh, in the Okanagan Valley. As a, a kid who came from there, and my wife's from West Kelowna, um, there's a lot of us out here thinking of them in a really tough time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well said. said, John. Well yep. said. Thank you. This is the Harrison Price Clip brought to you by Applewood Auto Group. And remember, it's all good at Applewood.